I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Kirsten Conrad, who has deep landscaping roots. She has degrees from Auburn University in ornamental horticulture and landscape design. And in addition, she ran her own landscaping business in the past. We're glad she gave that up and joined us as our extension agent for both the Arlington and Alexandria Master Gardener Group. And she supervises all the activities of our group, including these Friday talks. Kirsten, I'll turn it over to you and welcome. And I'm so appreciative that so many of you have decided to come out today to learn about this topic, because I truly believe, and I hope it will come out today, that I believe that this is a higher use for some of our landscape resources that we have. So yes, today we're doing a talk about edible landscape and designing the edible landscape. And you should have gotten three handouts that we might be referring to during the course of the talk. One on tips and tricks for landscape design, which are sort of general tips that can be applied no matter whether you're talking about edible plants or whether you're talking about ornamental plants. There was another one, kind of a list of edible plants, flowers, and so on. And a third one that Julie will put into the chat box as we go along. So I love this picture. This is a picture from a garden that's in Texas, actually. You can see that they created an oasis here. Okay, and that's what it's all about, is creating an oasis for us to use our garden resources. I have to start here with man's dominion over the earth. Um, 17,000 years ago in the cave paintings showed the beginnings of the notice of animals and plants around us and the beginnings of agriculture and that has progressed, you know, to the workings of folks in the Middle East and the embracing of agriculture as a, a sign of civilized people, and not least of all, a sign of man's dominion over the earth and all things in it. Versailles is an overabundant example of that use of conspicuous consumption, showing that we didn't need to use land for food production. But of course, we have come a long way since then. Of course, Capability Brown was the start of designing what was called back to nature sort of design, okay? He was an Englishman who designed Blenheim Palace. And Blenheim Palace sought to create those kinds of oases for people to visit, to recreate in, and to return the idea of nature, of design, of the natural environment, and do it in such a way as to recreate nature. Blenheim Palace is a lovely place to visit. Today, we're talking about how we make the most of our little piddly resources, okay? We may not have what the kings had at Versailles, but we do have our little spaces here. Sadly, you know, if we try to do something like this in many of our HOAs and townhouse communities, we would probably get in trouble for it. But I'm really pleased to see the times are changing and that people are getting the message that we can do more with our landscapes. Then this. This is a little bit of a dated picture, but it's not too far away from what we might consider to be a typical Northern Virginia home landscape. Grass, a few non-native shrubs, foundation plants, a few non-native trees for shrubs and flowering and ornamental purposes. And your challenge as we go along here is to keep thinking about how we can replace this dynamic with native plants or with edible plants. One of the joys of learning about landscape design is that it combines the best of what man can come up with, the best of nature, and the best of what we consider ornamental art, and creates something that's greater than the sum of the parts. And I really like that. And it's been put in other words before. Function and how the landscape works for people. And it does need to work for us. This is our space. This is our landscape. This is how we recreate. We also have to think about form. And by form, in terms of art, we're talking about the design of the space in some pleasing way that creates a form that gives more than what we have put into it. And of course, that word sustainability, it's probably one of the most overused, least understood words today. Of course, we're trying to create a world in which man and art and nature can coexist. Some people have labeled that sustainability, and we're going to look at that. I'd like to think of permaculture as being something that's beyond sustainability. Permaculture is the idea that we can take our landscapes 
how consciously designed landscapes and mimic the patterns and relationships found in nature. This has often been applied to gardening and or organic gardening or homestead designed in such a way to make the things that require very high maintenance to be up close to the home and where we live and work and play and gradually spacing those things out to the outer edges in rings. But the simplest explanation is what Graham Burnett uh, mentions down below. Permaculture has revolutionized the skies, this organic gardening. And I love that idea that we are, all of us together, embarked on a revolution to change the way people, particularly in urban areas, think about how they use the land that they have control over and how we can use the land for sustenance and for uh, independence. So is this sustainability? It's beautiful, for sure. Is it sustainability? Well, they have from a lawn area, they've created a water-wise landscape that combines flowering plants, it combines secular plants, all of it is water-wise. Not necessarily all native, but it is beautiful, it's sustainable, and it's much kinder to the environment. As we go through this presentation, I want you to be thinking about some of those ideas about man, about nature, about sustainability, about permaculture, and about design. Today, we're talking about some of the elements of landscape design to start with. Some of the elements include establishing focal points in your landscape, using mass plantings to carry the eye from one part of your landscape to another. Line and repetition are all elements that can help build coherence and cohesion into your design and your outdoor spaces. Color can be used in repetition. It can be used in mass plantings to carry an eye through a landscape. It can also be used to create special effects. You know, if you have a very long, narrow space you're working with, using hot colors down at the end of that space will help you to bring visually that space closer. If you have a short, broad space and you wish to at least give the illusion that it is a longer space, you can use cool colors because cool colors will seed. And this works no matter whether you're doing trees, shrubs, natives, or edible plants. One of the things we're going to be talking a lot about today is the use of outdoor rooms in the design process. The idea of using floors and walls and ceilings is a great way to organize your space and to think of how we can maximize the use of it. The picture here shows an espalier of an apple tree, which is being used to create a divider. What is that? That could be function as a wall in your landscape. So these are not edible plants, they're native plants. And all of us have been conditioned over a decade or so of being educated about the use of native plants in the landscape. And we understand the concept of native plants, floors in the garden room, ground covers, ginger on the upper left, green and gold on the upper right, lyre leaf sage on the lower left, of course, and wild strawberries on the lower right. These Plants are low, they function as ground covers. And what if we took that whole idea of using these as ground covers and changed them into edibles? Can we use the alpine strawberries? Yes, they're very good. They make a great ground cover that's only about six inches tall. We can have thyme in mass plantings. We can have pansies in mass plantings. These are things that you can use to create the effect of a ground cover, a lower level, either under a tree cover or even in the sunshine. Begin to think about edibles in the same way you think about the uses of plants in the landscape, and you will find a way to do that. Can you use the lettuces and the herbs as borders, as edible borders? Here's a picture on the lower left of different colored lettuces used in a very ornamental way as a kind of a border between two spaces, two walkways. Here we have in the upper right, we've got the beautiful kale mixed with parsley and shows the color and texture contrast there. And of course, the color differences of edible plants add a lot to the landscape, especially during the times when there isn't much blooming in our ornamental landscape. Here is nasturtium that's used as a border 
allows to soften the idea that hardscape fronts in the pathway. What a beautiful use of that. Don't just put it in the pot. Actually think of how an edible plant can function in the landscape. Let's talk about walls for a second. The walls in the garden room. From top left clockwise, we have Viburnum nudum. We've got Father Gilla on the right, Chokeberry on the lower right, Inkberry in the middle, and of course, Winterberry on the far left bottom. These are all medium-sized shrubs that will serve as walls that can be pruned into a hedge that can serve as a backdrop for other perennials in the foreground. What can we use as an edible plant to replace these? How about the espalier that I first showed you in the first picture? This is an espalier, another example of an espalier apple tree on the upper left. An espalier is a, is a good French word that just means trellising. You can have a espalier done against a wall that's free form. You can have a espalier done to a cable or a cable network with posts. You can do it to a standing fence. I've seen beautiful espaliers done to a split rail fence. And it's simply a matter of pruning and tying and training a woody plant to grow the way you want it to grow. Here on the upper right, we have okra and basil. Okra makes a great wall and it can be used in full sun to separate one area from another to form borders. I had a neighbor in my community garden plot that created garden plot walls out of tall, dead corn. It wasn't something she was going to eat. She just wanted to have that very tall, 10-foot tall wall. And she planted them about three inches apart and had a very solid wall by the end of the summer. You could do it with regular corn as well. The bottom right shows cardoons and kale as part of a border there. So this is a very uh, wonderful way to think of these plants. Here we have tried to use things like asparagus and funnel, which are much broader than they are tall, but they will also provide that border wall into a garden, which if you have the space, can be very effective as a texture contrast and as a color contrast to other plants. Like a spayer, trellising, you can do it with a lot of the different kinds of vining vegetable crops that will tolerate that kind of upright training. An upright training can be done on poles, it can be done on frameworks, it can be used as seating areas to help provide the multi-purpose functions in the landscape. On the upper left, we show a Malabar spinach growing on a pole. And if you've never grown that, I want to encourage you to try it sometime. We grew it out here in the back of Farrington Community Center on a wire trellis that was a divider for a big air conditioner there. And we had the purple fruited variety, which of course turned my hands bright purple pink when we came time to tear down the vines. Some people like to eat it. You cook it simply in the same way you cook spinach. It's really beautiful in the summer because it tolerates the heat and grows well there. Grapes do well, kiwi vines, and of course beans and even melons and squash can be used as vining plants over the top of a pergola or a trellis or an archway. Some of the heavier fruited things like melons, watermelons, cantaloupes, can also be grown on a trellis, cucumbers, but some of the heavier things need to be protected with a sling of some kind to tie the fruit up, help support the weight of it as it grows. And for that, you will need to have a very... The idea of ceilings and garden room is also embraced by something called a fruit tree guild. And this is a concept from permaculture again, which states that if we can recreate nature and the functions that plants serve in the landscape, we can support the growth of a multitude of different kinds of plants in the same area. Some of you know this more simply as three sisters, the corn, the beans, and the squash planted together. Here we have a fruit tree guild, which is in some ways a little bit more complex arrangement, but you have different functions that different plants are serving in the landscape. You've got a plant that serves as a ground cover. You've got a plant that serves as a dynamic accumulator of herbaceous layers that attract insects that provides nitrogen back to the soil. We've got plants there that serve as pest deterrents and help to send some of the predator insects away. We've got plants for pollinators and other plants that are helping to lay nitrogen down in the soil. Of course, there's a fruit tree that helps provide shade and protection. The 
picture on the left shows a serviceberry tree, a gorgeous uh, four season, all season tree, which we'll look at some pictures again of that. If you get the fruit early enough before the rust disease gets it, it's a wonderful fruit to eat. And it has beautiful flowers, nice fall color, and lovely winter form in the landscape. One of the reasons we talk about a garden room and design in that way is to establish something called the bones of the garden. And as you think about your own spaces, I want you to encourage you to think about what the bones of that space are. And when we look at the slide, which is primarily this is an ornamental garden, but the bones here are provided by the hedgerows, the lines, the focal points in the center there with the hedge here, the lines along the side of the lawn. The focus of the lawn is merely as a pathway, and that can be used that way as well. We have accent points here, and of course we have a frame for the garden back here. Why do I talk about this as being bones? Because the bones are what holds the garden together in the wintertime. One of the criticisms of the non-ornamental garden is that in the wintertime, there's nothing there. There's no form, there's no structure, there's no beauty to the vegetable garden in the wintertime. Well, some of us disagree with that, but for those who have not yet drank that Kool-Aid, you can add structure to the vegetable garden. You can add bones to the vegetable garden to help make it seem as if it was a designed, intentional creation. And one of the best ways to do that is to mix ornamentals with your edibles. What are the bones of this garden? You know, we looked at this picture already. You know, we've got sort of bones. We've got, you know, the driveway. We've got the walkway. We've got the trees hanging over the top here. We've got these base structures here, which serve no purpose other than to decorate the house. As you look at your spaces, think about how we might replace the non-edible, merely functional plants that probably are not even native plants with something that's edible. Question is, how do I start that process? One of the best ways to start that process is to make a drawing. An overhead drawing is very helpful. This is an interesting thing, is to try to recreate your landscape in a horizontal overhead view. Try to identify the existing plants that are in your landscape first, and then make another layer, which helps you to understand about what the function of the plants are in the landscape. And my challenge to you is that if you cannot identify a function for the landscape plants that you have now, how do we go about finding that? Go ahead and find out whether you can replace that. You know, if, you, if it's serving as a screen, great. It has a job to do. If it's serving as a focal point, it has a job to do, great. If it's serving as a mass and a lead up to the rest of the landscape and on a decoration for your house, great. That's an okay job to do. Can we make it do more? For example, in this drawing, we would like to say we're going to do a native garden. But you could do this process if you wanted to have a blue garden, if you wanted to have a white garden, if you wanted to have an edible garden, which we'll look at next. But if you wanted to have a native garden and you needed to have an evergreen shrub that was four by four feet mounted, coarse texture, winter interest, hey, Inkberry would do the job. Pink stew bloom azaleas will be fine with the deciduous shrub, two and a half by five feet. Sweet shrub, it's a big, big plant. Maybe it's a little bit bigger than six by six, but you can find a cultivar that will serve that purpose, okay? You can have cardinal flowers serving as the mass plantings in the front. And of course, a little blue stem grasses as an ornamental grass, 30 inches tall, upright, medium inches, far inches. Do I mean to say that these are the only plants you could use for these functions? No, you can use any plant that suits the size and space and texture and the ornamental criteria that you want to have, you can find a native plant that will do that job. Let's switch over to edibles, okay? So let's have an edible landscape design. High bush blueberries. What's gonna take a herbaceous perennial? How about mixture of bulls, bumps, beets, and curly parsley mixed together? Can you see it? Can you see the color? How about the ornamental grass? Well, you probably won't want five of them in that space, but asparagus or fennel would be very good there. 
just don't let the funnel go to seed because you will have a million funnel babies growing in your landscape. Rosemary or chokeberry plants will serve as wonderful background, bushy shrubs with substance, and of course a deciduous shrub, six by six feet. How about a pawpaw? Well, my pawpaw is now about 12 feet tall in the backyard, and so that's maybe not the most inspired choice there. But I think you get the idea that you could replace your ornamental plants with edible plants that have the same function in the landscape. As you do that, you want to consider your plant combinations. You want to mix your ornamentals and edibles, not only for interest, but also for seasonality and to carry over the aesthetics of the season from one season to another. You want to make sure, and this is very important, the second point, make sure that you are putting the plants that like certain kinds of conditions with other plants that like the same conditions. In my previous picture with the blueberries, as you all know, blueberries require very, very acid soil. If you're going to put that in the same landscape with others that don't like acid soil, you're going to have a situation where at least one of them is not going to be happy. Okay, so make sure that if your plants like to have wet soil, if they like to have high light, that you're giving them those conditions and not trying to force them to grow in conditions that they're not going to do well in. Do you want to have texture, color, form? Do you want to have a mass of okra growing together as a single specimen plant in the landscape? Could okra serve as your six by six foot shrub? Sure it could. But remember that there's not going to be there in the wintertime. At some point, you're going to have to cut that down. For biological benefits, do you need to think about whether your entire garden will attract the beneficial pollinators? You might want to put some plants in there that will repel some of the uh, pest insects that attract the two our vegetable gardens. Symbiosis, the internet is full of lists of plants that should be grown together. You know, tomato with basil. Don't grow carrots with radishes and so on and so on and so on and so on, okay? Um, and of course, you're going to want to achieve a good balance on pollination, plants that will attract the pollinators so that we do have the food. But look at what you can achieve. Here we have boxwood. Boxwood plants with rhubarb, asparagus, and poppies, maybe. What's going to happen come wintertime? Well, the rhubarb's going to be gone. The poppies are going to be pretty much cut down to the ground. The asparagus can be left somewhat up there, but of course you're gonna have the boxwood hedge to serve as a frame for your garden that will be a presence there in the winter time. Could that hedge be provided by something other than boxwood? Yeah, I hope so. You know, you could use um, lavender, you can use rosemary. There's a lot of plants you could use to supply the hedge effects um, that will also give you an edible crop. Look at the colors. Here we have uh, Lachinata kea, dinosaur kea with Sambucus. Uh, you can come work with the cultivars that are available. Aria, for example, is a cultivar of Sambucus nigra. And you can play around with the grasses and the different colors of grasses, the different colors of kale, for example, to create a color scheme here that is the envy of any garden. Here we have artichokes and river birch together. What a color combination, what a texture combination. Look at the variation in drama, you know, that is created by putting something like this in the landscape. Color, color, we talked about color already, but smoky fennel, um, charred beets. Many of the plants have highly ornamental leaves and stems. Here's Can I a interrupt for a second? Yes. With a question, yes. and while you're talking about structure, someone mentioned they're allergic to boxwood, and could you suggest any other alternatives which might be good for structure? Well, I mentioned two of them, lavender, rosemary. When we talk about shrubs in just a moment, we have some more listings there. So let me, if I can just hold that thought. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah, great, great question. This is a publication that's put out by Virginia Tech, Recommended Vegetables for Virginia. And I giggle when I read this because what grows well here in Northern Virginia may not be the same cultivars that grow in Southside Virginia. But when you look at this list, you see a laundry list of ordinary, everyday vegetables for the vegetable garden, right? Can we make them serve as ornamentals too? 
So the question is, can we take beans and peas and put them on a trellis and make them into walls? Would that work as a frame for your garden rather than boxwood? Sure it would. It's temporary, but the frame will remain. Can we mass together the colors of beets or carrots and the texture of carrot leaves to be floors in your garden? Can we make a swath, a sweep of radishes that will be obviously picked and be diminished as we pick them for edging or for ground cover? How about some of the leafy greens? Can we use eggplant as a focal point in the garden? Well, I don't know about you, my eggplant gets eaten by flea beetle, but the fruit is amazing and it's beautiful. And there's so many variations there that it's well worth trying to grow. Leafy greens, such as kale, collards, and chard, add a lot of texture to the garden. And of course, the salad greens, as we've already seen pictures of, add mass plantings and sweeps of color through the landscape that are very welcome and wonderful contrast with the ornamentals. Pumpkin and cucumber, and of course, squash. Um, some of the vining squashes can be used on trellising to provide a ceiling. How about the okra? Great wall in the garden, especially as a backdrop. Turnips, yep, you get the idea here. Try to find an alternative purpose, an additional purpose for your vegetable crops. The plant we often turn to for walls and, and of course for, for thinking about ornamental gardening are herbs. And the most important point, not only with herbs, but also with some of the traditional vegetable crops is that we have to understand what their life cycle is. Um, we have divide, these divided up into cool season and warm season crops. Um, I read a little video about cilantro the other day and somebody was saying, well, this is how we keep cilantro going all year round and we keep replanting it. Okay, great. But it really is a cool season crop that does better in spring and fall, does reseed. Dill is an annual. And that's what the A means after some of these words. Parsley, of course, is a biennial, which will come back the second year to produce flowers. Um, but typically it's grown as an annual. Warm season herbs are all those, those the Mediterranean ones that love to have the heat. Okay. If you put something that loves heat with something that loves cool, you might not get such good results, but some of these are perennial. Okay, the mints, thyme, chives, oregano, these are all perennials that will come back year after year after year if they don't get flooded out in the wintertime. And that is the biggest problem with our perennial herb. Our clay soils hold too much water. They don't like it. They tend to die in the wintertime. And it's not often from the cold, it's from the wet roots. Some of the perennial vegetables that we can grow will come up here on the slide, but they include things like asparagus, rhubarb, things that will come back every year. They can be the mainstay of your gardens. So let's talk about shrubs for a moment. These are edible perennial shrubs, and I have taken the ones in green, those are natives, and those are the ones we're focusing on because we can do more than just planting edibles. We can do more than just planting natives. We can plant ones that are natives and edibles. The ones in the bottom do well here. They are listed as being able to be grown here and will provide an edible crop for you, but they are not native. I'm not throwing them out with the bath water, but you know, you can have your cake and eat it too. You can have your natives and your edibles. The picture here is of Che or Chi. I don't, I don't know how I've been, I've never grown it. I've, I've never seen it, but it is listed on the Virginia Tech Shrubs publication as having an edible fruit it makes me want to try it. It's a large spreading shrub that would be good as a focal point or as a backdrop. The T. camellia we'll see again as an evergreen. We have some evergreen listed here. Here we have red chokeberry. And I have a friend who has red chokeberry growing, screen a second story window, a set of windows, and it works very well as a lacy screen with the red berries that are at the top of the plant. That's really great. The black choke bear is a much shorter plant. Both of them are very popular with the birds and provide wonderful, very late food for migrating birds, but they are also edible for us. The choke bear and the aronia species are great landscape, nice fall color, nice form in the landscape as well. Here we have beach plum, which you often see closer to the coast. 
but I have heard of somebody successfully growing it here in urban Arlington. This is a salt and drought tolerant plant, and that's something we also need to think about. What is happening with our climate? As our climate changes, we're going to have to find plants that tolerate not only drought, but also occasional flooding. Here we have a plant that's in the rose family, and so it is subject to all the same ills as any other member of the rose family, but it's a gorgeous flower. It's a wonderful fruit, and they have beach plum festivals from Maine to Virginia. If you've ever had a chance to attend, do so, because it's a wonderful fruit to eat. Hybris blueberry, we get a lot of questions and very popular fruit about how to grow blueberries here. For our zone 7A and higher, the southern highbush blueberry is going to be the one you want. For best results, you should try to have more than one variety that blooms at the same time. And there are wonderful publications put out by Virginia Tech on the combinations of varieties and how to grow blueberries. But it's a nice plant. It's got great fall color, nice form. It can be pruned, it has great fruit if you can keep the birds from stealing it all. It's well worth trying to grow. So this is a plant that requires very low pH, a very acid soil. And I think the people that have not been successful at growing this plant are not paying enough attention to the pH of the soil or the water level. This needs a well-drained soil. It needs a highly organic soil. And it needs an inch of water per week. It really does. It's not going to be a very drought tolerant for you. Honeyberry is listed here. I want to give a shout out to a particular website and a business which is located in Afton, Virginia. This is of the Edible Landscape business. They do a, a mail order business. They do sell this plant. It's a very unusual plant, very similar to blueberries. It's called honeyberry. Look at the form. Look at the beauty of the plant and the shape of the plant. And notice the irrigation line underneath it. So an inch of water per week is the standard minimum amount of water that we recommended for our landscape plants. Currants are a really great plant. Here's uh, different kinds of currants. You've got black currants, white currants, red currants, and it's a small landscape plant that will tolerate a wide range of pH conditions, soil conditions. It's very shallow rooted, so it's not going to tolerate drought very well going to be best to plant this with two different cultivars together. Gooseberries, something I grew up with. This is something that is going to be better suited for some of the colder areas, but it will grow here. And the fruit turns purple when it's ripe. So this is a beautiful one. Flower and quince is a neglected, old-fashioned landscape shrub that's grown for its ornamental flowers. But it does have an edible fruit. You can make quince jellies out of it. The fruit is useful for a variety of uses. Beautiful flowers, nice shape, can be pruned. It has thorns though, so not something you want to put in the foreground of your landscape. A few other plants that are evergreen. These are shrubs that are evergreen for the edible garden. Here's a picture of prickly pear. I don't know how you feel about cactus, but it does fine here and does have edible components to it. Bay laurel is the laurel leaf, the bay leaf that we use in our cooking. It is marginally hardy here. It will survive some years. I know that there was a plant in one of our community gardens that reached about six feet tall and lived for many years before it was killed back in one of our more severe winters. Loquat is a southern plant that is a large shrub. And I hope you're taking pictures of these slides and they're, uh, they should be on your list of plants as well because these are plants that we've not seen here. And I'm pushing the envelope here a little bit because T. camellia, loquat, bay laurel, and so on, pineapple guava. These are plants that probably 10 years ago couldn't be grown here, but now they're okay. They can be grown here because of the way the climate change is decreasing the amount of cold weather in the wintertime and increasing the heat in the summer. Strawberry tree, lingonberry, and box huckleberry. These are two that are listed in the Virginia Tech's Edible Shrubs publication. These are very short ground cover like shrubs, along with um, actually cranberries actually mentioned occasionally as being something that can be grown here in well-drained soils. Lingonberry is a vaccinium. That's the same family as blueberries. And along with box huckleberry, they both need to have acid soils to do well. But these are very low grown shrubs that are well worth a try. There are a number of different trees that have edible components to them. 
This picture is of a Cornelian cherry. And of course, everybody knows about peaches and apples and cherries. And notice that I don't put apples on here because I fear that you cannot produce a quality apple here without a spray program. And the idea here is that we are trying to reduce the amount of chemicals and pesticides in the landscape, and certainly the amount of pesticides on our food as well. So apple is not listed here, but there are many other native plants that are listed native small trees. And of course, the picture is of a cornery and cherry, which has a lovely little fruit that can be edible. Figs are not native, but they're grown widely and very popular. Let's look at some of these. Here we have service bay again. It's typically grown as a multi-trunk small tree. And it's one of my favorite trees as an ornamental. It can also be your favorite tree as an edible. Sadly, we have a disease which attacks this called rust. The rust attacks the fruit. It's a fungal disease that attacks the fruit, the leaves, and of course the stems of the tree. It rarely kills the tree. And if you can harvest the fruit early enough, you can get an edible fruit that's not affected by the rust disease. Pawpaws, highly ornamental, wonderful big leaf, kind of tropical looking tree. We used to call these Indiana bananas. And the flower is pictured on the lower left. And of course the fruit is on the right. And I was told that I had to wait until the fruit was almost rotten to be able to eat it. Well, it's a wonderful fruit to eat, big seeds that are easily grown by the way. And if you are thinking about adding a pawpaw to your landscape, consider adding two of them from different genetic sources because they will flower, they will fruit better that way. American plum, we have one grown behind the Farrington Community Center in part of the small spaces garden. And recently at the home of a master gardener, I saw an American plum that has been trained into a small tree. But typically this is a thicket forming plant, but again, it can be trained. And it is a small tree with beautiful white flowers in the spring and plum fruit in the summertime. Persimmon, we have both Asian as well as the native persimmons. The Asian is pictured on the left, the native persimmon is pictured on the right, and here we have the trunk of the tree in the middle here, which shows the characteristic blacky bark. Interestingly enough, the non-native persimmons are from Asia, and when they're grown here, they are often grafted onto native persimmon rootstock so that they can withstand the cold better. Meadow is a self-fruitful Asian persimmon. Otherwise, you will need to have a, a male and a female. Elderberry, if you're lucky enough to get the fruits before the birds do, is a wonderful plant to grow. Likes the wet soil. It's very shallow rooted. You can use it as hedges. You can use it as specimen plants. They grow as kind of like a cane-like thicket in clumps. Here's a picture of what they look like in the field. I looked at this picture and thought, my gosh, they got berries, they got, they've got fruit, and the birds haven't eaten it all. But uh, elderberry wine, everybody's heard of that. Elderberry jelly, the fruit is wonderfully useful in a variety of ways and can be eaten out of hand as well. But you can see the relative size of these plants, and they can be cut down to the ground every year and maintained that way. Finally, I, I've got brown turkey fig here. Um, there are three types that are hardy here in Northern Virginia. Um, they can be killed back by a cold winter. And when that happens, I tell folks to go ahead and cut it down to the ground because the stumps are ugly uh, and it will grow, regrow very, very quickly. It adds a wonderful texture to the landscape. The figs are delightful without any kind of problems. They never have diseases or pest problems and they're very useful and can be eaten in a variety of ways. Medium trees include crab apples, alligator chinkapin, which is a nut tree in the chestnut family, mulberries, which I've listed as being some native and some not native. We have Morris rubra, which is the native one, and of course Morris alba, which is the non-native. And one of the important things about this is that there are very few Morris rubra plants occurring in the wild because they have so cross-bred with Morris alba, which is more aggressive. And most of the trees that occur in the wild today are hybrids with Morris alba. Wonderful food to eat, that mulberry, and they're highly sought after, but do not plant a red-fruited Morris mulberry over your car or your sidewalk or your driveway because they do make a mess. 
filbert, hazelnut, lovely plant, great plant, small shrub in the landscape. And then of course we have a variety of other ones listed here. Trifoliate orange is a thorny tree that has a wonderfully aromatic fruit, which is definitely not like an orange plant, the tree or fruit that you would eat, but the peel is used in a variety of ways, as is the fruit. And you can see one at the Chinkapin Community Garden in Alexandria. Jujubes, it's a fruit that looks like about half the size of your thumb, and it's very much like a date. And, and one of our demonstration gardens down at the Simpson Park in Alexandria has a jujube tree, which is wonderful to see. Okay, let's look at some of these. Here's crab apples. There are three native crab apples, two that do best here are Malus coronaria, Malus angustifolia, uh, the northern and the southern crab apples. Beautiful flowers, beautiful form and can be ideal for a small garden. The fruit can be used in jellies. It's very high in pectin and vitamin C and makes a wonderful base for other kinds of jelly like mint jelly and so on that don't have natural pectin. Allegheny chinkapin, a small tree that can be trained to be a more upright, less of a shrubby type as pictured here. It is not the chestnut tree of American law, but it is uh, in the same family. Here's the red mulberry, great leaf texture, great form of the tree, wonderful shade tree, wonderful for birds, okay? But they are messy, and so you wanna be careful about where you plant this. Filbert has an edible nut. It likes acidic, well-drained, rich, moist soils, and typically it grows in the understory of the landscape. Let's go on to vines and brambles. We have a few native ones here. I've listed box grape, but I should have also listed muscadine grape, the non-native, the passion flower, the blackberry, red raspberry, black raspberry, and the fox grape are all native plants that provide food for us and for the birds and the wildlife. Wineberry is a non-native, wonderful fruit that occurs wild here. Sadly, it is on the invasive plants list here, and we are encouraged to remove it. Anybody who's a forager in the woods knows that wineberry has delectable fruit that is like a raspberry or blackberry fruit. And then, of course, there's hardy kiwi. Passion flower, full sun, part shade, has no pests that we know of. The flowers do attract butterflies, and the edible fruit is called maypop sometimes. That's another name for the fruit because it's hollow on the inside, and it will produce a juice and can be used in a variety of ways. The vine itself can be a very heavy woody vine, and so you want to be careful about where it's planted, and it will reseed as well. Here's fox grape. Fox grape is native. One of the concerns about fox grape in our native occurring woods is that it is a favorite food of the spotted lanternfly. And we do not have a spotted lanternfly established population that we know of in Arlington or Alexandria yet, but it has devastated the Shenandoah Valley areas where it has been established since 2017. You'll be interested to know that the outbreak that occurred in Pennsylvania starting in 2014 has pretty much leveled out. It has flattened out due to natural predators, disease pathogens which have hit the spotted lanternfly, which have followed the evolution of the insect in the environment. So we're pleased to hear that some of the natural predators and pathogens are taking a toll on those populations and will eventually catch up to the insect in Virginia as well. If you see an insect that looks like this, we'd like to know about it. And we'd like for you to report it, and not only that, but to bring us a sample of it to the Fair Island Community Center or to any extension office. Blackberry is something I grew up with harvesting on transitioning fields that were abandoned and it grows in huge thickets. In the home landscape, it can be trained to be grown on a mock trellis sort of, but it is biennial. It should be pruned in such a way to encourage new growth to keep coming out. And the second year growth is what's going to be producing the best fruit. The pruning of the fruit of for raspberry as well, you can see that it's trained up against a wall and it's tied up with a string. It also tied to more formal arbors as well as espalier type fences. It's best to keep it contained like this because otherwise the root suckers will come up in other areas of your yard and you have a 
raspberries where you don't want them. Blackberries grow the same way. Anyway, we have reds, blacks, yellows, wonderful fruit in early summer. Here we have kiwi. Hardy kiwi has a small fruit. There's also a fuzzy kiwi that grows well here. Edible landscape cells, plants that are hardy to minus 25 degrees. We certainly don't need that much hardiness here, but um, they are very prolific and will produce a lot of fruit if they are treated correctly and they're grown and they're happily grown. You're going to need a male and a female plant for best fruit production. And you're going to have to keep it pruned vigorously to keep it in fruiting mode as opposed to vegetative leafy growth. Water is going to be essential with this production. And of course, that's true of any plant that is producing fruit if our natural rainfall is not sufficient. Large trees, I'm not going to go into too much detail on these. We have all native fruit or nut trees here that can produce some aspect of edibility for your landscape. Now, most of us have to work with the trees we already have, but if you're replacing a tree, you might consider using one of these. Walnut gets a bad and possibly undeserved rap for emitting a substance called jucalone into the soil, which is said to be unfriendly to many other plants, inhibits the growth of them. Um, I recently heard a professor at Master Gardner College talk about the fact that perhaps the water had been over maligned for that quality and that the effects were over hyped. Anyway, try it. It's a beautiful tree. We don't have many of them. Butternut also has an issue with a butternut disease that has affected most of the trees in the wild. Breed programs are trying to develop a butternut that is tolerant of this disease that has decimated the population. Hickories are some of my favorite trees. They're very slow. Caria obeda and Caria lachinosa are two of the best nut producing trees. They will take seven years to produce nuts though. So it'll take a long time for hickory to do its thing. In the meantime, it'll be a gorgeous tree for you that produces great fall color and a gorgeous bark, nice tree in the landscape. Pecan, here's a picture of pecan on the upper right and it's a big tree. And there are several varieties that are extremely hardy here and will grow just fine. The leading producer of pecans in the country is in Georgia, but with climate change, we're going to catch up to them, maybe. Here we have beech trees. In this picture right here, they have a beech nut, which is a small, almost triangular looking nut, which can be roasted or processed for food. Sugar maple, in the bottom right picture here, it is, of course, famous for its sap that we process into maple syrup. Sadly, the species migration has occurred and in the wild, sugar maple is not as prominent here as it used to be. The species is moving north with climate change and it's no longer used as a street tree here. The picture on the lower left here, of course, is of a walnut. And of course, here we have butternut in the middle picture. Since you've got trees, you've also got shade. And we need to celebrate our shade because it makes our spaces livable. But you can have your shade and your edible plants as well. Okay, and here's a list of some plants that would do fine in a, an understory setting. You've got persimmon, which of course is a small tree of its very own kind. Ginseng, raspberry, and gooseberry. These are all plants that survive and tolerate some shade in the landscape and you should try to plant them underneath a high canopy. If you've got oak trees in your landscape, try to use these in that space because they will tolerate some shade. Tea camellia, jostaberry, kiwi will of course, like most plants that produce berries and fruit will perform better where it has full sun, but it will tolerate and produce fruit in an understory setting. So do consider that. Let's talk about light just a little bit because those plants that require light to produce tomatoes and pepper and other kinds of fruits do require eight plus hours of light a day. The plants that we grow in a garden that we harvest leaves from, typically spinach, kale, collards, and that sort of thing, they really will thrive on and tolerate four to six hours of light per day. 
So if you have a shady situation, especially one that maybe shields from the very hot afternoon sun, but only gets it in the morning, try growing some of these in these first two columns in those spaces. The lowest needs for light are the leafy greens. After that comes the root crops. And after that, with the highest light needs are the cucumbers and the melons and the squash and the eggplants and beans and, and the uh, tomatoes and peppers and so on. Typically, anything that flowers and fruits are going to need the highest light levels. Here are a few things for the urban garden that will produce grain or seed for you. Sweet corn, Indian corn, amaranth, sunflower, sorghum. Just a note about corn. Corn, in order to produce a well-pollinated uh, ear of corn, will need to be planted in a block. Because it's wind pollinated, the wind has to move the pollen from one plant to another. And that doesn't happen very well when you just have three plants or four plants all separated in your landscape. So plant them together, plant a block of them or several rows of them if you have room, uh, you'll have better pollination. Amaranth is a flower. The amaranth produces a seed, of course, right? But it's a beautiful flower as well. And one of the questions that we often get is, how do I plant edible flowers? But this is a long list of edible flowers here that can be planted in the garden. And we have everything from herbs to ornamentals, okay? We've got things here that are sometimes considered weeds, violets and dandelions that can be eaten. We've got typical garden plants, chives and onions. The flowers are edible. We've got rugula and cilantro, which are typically considered as herbs. So there are lots of things that are grown in the garden that you can replace your non-edible ornamental plants with that can be harvested for eating. Some of these are perennials, some of them are annuals. And uh, the next slide talks about these perennial crops a little bit more. But remember that if you have space in your garden that you want to harvest, you can always replant with a second crop for a later crop in the fall. Here are some perennial crops that you won't probably want to do that with, okay? If you plant asparagus, for example, in a part of your landscape, you're going to have asparagus there all year round, and you will have it there in fire years if it's taken care of. Lovage is a great ornamental, edible, leafy green herb in the garden. Jerusalem sunchoke. If you plant sunchoke, artichokes in the landscape, you're going to have a spread of them. They spread rapidly through the landscape. It's best to put them in some kind of a, an area where they can be contained. Ramps grows in the woods, and they're rare and highly sought after in our landscape, but they do well in cooler situations. Ostrich ferns, you would harvest the fiddlehead from the base of the plant when it's first starting to grow. But it's a perennial plant, which looks gorgeous the rest of the year. So take advantage of these perennial crops in your landscape. Some of these things have the asterisk on them that are usually grown as annuals. Kale, highly ornamental, and will overwinter in your garden. Sometimes it'll kill back, sometimes it won't. But the second year, it will produce a flower. Um, garlic will overwinter. In fact, it typically is grown that way. If you plant the garlic in December and harvest it in June, the definition of well, winter. These are plants that will possibly come back every year after year after year. So let's talk about climate change just for a second. And there are lots of plants that we are not growing here very commonly that we probably ought to look at. Other questions that we'd like to stop and talk about before we go on, Colleen? There was one about how do you prevent lovage from bolting? I'd say plant it as a fall crop and you will have it in the springtime, but that's going to be effectively the second year of growth. And so that's when it wants to produce its flowers and seeds. If you plant leverage in the springtime as seeds, I think you'll be able to manage to avoid that bolting the first year. Someone asked if you should wait a year to harvest rhubarb to let it establish itself more. Ah, rhubarb and asparagus is that way too. Many of these perennial crops, if you are planting new root starts of that, they appreciate having a few years in the ground to be able to build up their strength and root mass so that they can stand the harvesting. There are very specific instructions about asparagus, for example, that would apply to rhubarb as well. You don't want to harvest all the leaves 
at any one year. For instance, asparagus, you will harvest them when they're about a foot tall or nine inches tall. And then once they get beyond that, you want to leave some of them to go up and produce leaves so that they can strengthen the rootstock. Rhubarb, I would say in the second or even probably third year, you can harvest up to a third of that plant before you should let it re rebuild its strength. Do you have any hints about blanching asparagus? I just returned from Denmark where we had white asparagus. That was yeah. wonderful. It's a very different experience and it's a different taste. And I happen to like it very much. That's more tender. Basically, the way it's grown is you, when it first starts to poke its head out of the ground, you keep piling soil around the stems. And when the soil reaches about, you know, eight, nine inches tall, you will cut it off at the base. If it hasn't been exposed to light, it will be white. All right, so we were starting to talk about climate change on some of the slides, but I want to mention some of these to you because these are things that we probably ought to consider. These are things that are not being grown widely, but these are crops that tolerate hotter temperatures. For the most part, they are annuals, and they are things that are going to be, in our climate, uh, need to be replanted. But here we have a picture of cassava. Everybody thinks of cassava as being a tropical plant. Well, folks, we are in tropical climate these days. Uh, here we have malanga, cocoa yam. And of course, down here, the turban garlics are beautiful. Look at these. So think about the ornamental qualities of these as we go along. More hot climate greens for you. If you're worried about bolting vegetables in the summertime, try some of these hot weather greens. Here we have something called mizuna, and this is tatsoi in the middle here. Uh, very similar to bok choy, kang kong. I love the names. These are greens that will grow in the heat and given enough water will form well for us here. The bottom picture, of course, shows the Malabar spinach, which is a green that can be harvested all summer long. Pick the stems, pick the leaves, and of course, it has a very highly ornamental, either white or purple fruit, which looks beautiful on the vine. And of course, many of the herbs will tolerate very hot temperatures. And so if you're looking for something where you can water, and of course, herbs are going to require less water than some of these others. If you have a hot space, try some of these other plants that are out there, okay? There's a lot of plant breeding going on for climate change, particularly as it relates to food crops. Cultivars are being developed with a shorter reproductive cycle. And the cultivars that flower at cooler times of the day or even at nighttime to be able to beat the heat. Here are some examples of more crops that can be grown here that are very exotic. Look at this bitter melon here on the upper left. Bottom right is something called Chinese red noodles. And I've seen those grown in one of our demonstration gardens and they're spectacularly beautiful. Long, long red beans. And then on the lower left, we have something called ripper rail beans, which will be very similar to our cow peas or black eyed peas. Try something different. Here's something called Turkish eggplant in the upper left. Uh, look how beautiful that is. Wouldn't you like to serve that at dinner and say, this is eggplant? Yeah. In the picture in the middle right, we have uh, amaranth. And this is another grain producing plant, which you can also eat the greens, the leaves of, and stems of when it's young. Corn is actually remarkably heat tolerant as well as cold tolerant, and strains have been developed that will tolerate this. The, the magic ingredient here in tolerating heat is going to be water for the most part. The picture on the lower left is something I have wanted to grow for a long time. I just haven't gotten around to it. This is orange or purple passion. It's harvested as a green. And talk about a color pop in the garden. Planted that in mass or mix it in with your other green crops and it'll be as good as flowers. When you cook this, it turns green. But most of the solanaceae foods eggplants, the nightshade, tomatillos, tomatoes, and peppers too. These are plants that will tolerate heat. And if you're worried about it, look for a variety which is labeled for that particular use. So why do we make the trouble? Why do we do this? You know, if we talked about man and nature and art at the beginning of this thing, and it's not quite as lofty as that. But why do we do this? We do it for food production, for sure. It's fun to go out and pick your food for your dinner, right? 
We do it for sustainable land use. You know, maybe it's a little bit of a one-upmanship to show people how they can use land in such a way to produce food, to produce edible flowers, to do something more with it than simply putting Japanese honeysuckle or Japanese hollies on it. Certainly we do it to support the wildlife. And of course, those of us who are gardeners know that we have to fight the wildlife and share it with our wildlife if we want to have a crop. Certainly we do it for bragging rights. Hey, look at my tomato, you know? And, and on that note, I should mention to you that the Arlington County Fair has a competitive exhibit section where you can submit your tomato and your peppers for blue ribbon bragging rights. Do look for those rules to enter the fair, which happens from the 16th to the 19th of August. So it's lots of fun. And we hope that you will enjoy what we're doing here because if it's not fun, we should be buying our groceries from the farmer's market. This is fun. You have to do it with a sense of humor, too. This is Gunnar Tinktoya. I saw this growing in Europe. I've not seen it as much here, but of course it does fine here. Uh, it likes to grow on the water's edge. But this is a plant you can eat. You can eat the stems in much the same way you eat the rhubarb. But this is massive. I don't know if you can see the scale of this plant from the picture but this is six feet tall by about 12 feet wide. It's a very impressive plant. Some of the challenges we have in growing edible gardens, first of all, bare spots. I get this question a lot. What do I do in my ornamental edible garden when I harvest something? We'll be ready to put something else back there. Have your framework, your bones of your garden ready to go so that when you want to harvest something, it doesn't leave it completely bare. Disease is a concern, and we have a lot of information for you about how to prevent fungal disease in the landscape, but one of the best ways is to start with disease-resistant varieties, okay? You can have your edible ornamental that's beautiful, but you can also find ones that are disease-resistant. Avoid overcrowding, avoid overhead watering like today. Water needs, if we can keep our plants from being stressed out, give them the one inch of water they need, they will be much healthier, they will perform better, and they will be able to prevent uh, insects and disease pathogens from attacking them. Make sure you have the space for a garden. One of our challenges is that there's a public perception that vegetable gardens are ugly in the wintertime. They don't need to be. And I think it's up to us to try to help folks understand how to make a garden attractive in all four seasons. One of the ways is to establish that framework. And uh, the winter aesthetics of a vegetable garden are not impossible to maintain. One of the tools you can use to create that is, we talked about this already, is build a structure, provide the bones. You can use herbs for that, those hedges. You can use small shrubs. Yopan holly is a native plant that produces edible fruit. It's a great substitute for Japanese holly to the question about foundation plants and substitutes for boxwood. Gooseberry can be pruned and makes a wonderful hedge. Currants and blueberries can be pruned into a hedge as well. Espalier, in other words, using tree fruit and vines to grow on a low fence can be used as a hedge or as a wall around your garden. If we make it look intentional, then people will see it that way combining the textures and the use of knowledge of design in all four seasons will go a long way to making vegetable gardening in traditionally ornamental spaces more acceptable. Thinking outside the box will also provide some structure and interest in the garden. Make sure that you are planting plants that will attract pollinators, attracting beneficial insects to help fight off the bad guys. And of course, we've had a bad, bad year this year with aphids. Uh, beneficial insects are one of the major helps that you can provide with ladybugs and lace bugs, lace wings. Another beneficial insects will help you in the garden if we can avoid killing them off. Use companion plantings that will help you by repelling certain of the more noxious pests. Use vertical gardening to save space. And here's a couple of pictures from San Diego and elsewhere to show all kinds of innovations. This is a modified hydroponic unit on the right side with the lettuces growing in pipes in which water is continuously flowing through the pipes. 
And the bottom picture shows a wall unit that has pockets. These herb plants are planted in these pockets, you know, harvested as needed and replaced as they are harvested. Have fun with it. Here's a picture of globe artichoke with heavy metal switchgrass, a strictly ornamental with a globe artichoke. And play with the colors, combine similar colors. If you want to do a blue garden, <laughs> great. Have a blue garden, mix it up together. Finally, I want to show you this picture to you because one of the basic things you can do to start is to look at your landscape and think about what the function of each plant is in your landscape and how you can replace that plant with something that serves the same purpose, but also has a food producing aspect. For example, these herbaceous ornamentals that are on the side here, you know, you can see I kind of tried to assign a value to each of these plants that were in the picture. The coneflowers on the left side, can amaranth serve the same purpose as that? Sure it can. Lettuce makes a great ground cover or a border around the front of the bed. Rhubarb can provide a big leaf accent plant in the landscape that will help fill up a space. Plant beans on the walls, okay? Daylilies, cardoon. There's ample opportunity for you to take ornamental edibles and replace your non-edible ornamentals with them. And it's not just the herbaceous plants. Look at the next story up, the shrubs, the blueberries, the service bay, the pawpaw, the jujube trees, of course, the pear. These are all plants that will do fine for you in your garden and where you can find a place for them by substituting them for your only ornamental crops. We also can make an effort to try to convince the policymakers in our communities about how to facilitate ornamental landscapes and edible landscapes at the same time. This is an old picture of a San Francisco city courthouse, I believe, that shows a circular bed simply placed on top of a plaza and filled with soil to grow edible plants. There are wonderful organizations working in our area to help promote urban agriculture. Friends of Urban Agriculture is here in Arlington supporting an expansion of use of public space for food production. There's an organization in Fairfax, as well as in Falls Church, that helps support education about edible ornamental and edible public plantings. So work with us to try to communicate to folks that they can do this. You can do this. There's a picture of kale, chard, and of course the pollinating attracting alyssum, the coneflower behind it. Great way to combine ornamentals with animals. A help desk is at the Farrington Community Center. It's open daily from 9 to 12. Um, you can call us, you can walk in, you can contact me through these numbers and emails. The website for the Master Gardens of Northern Virginia have fabulous resources for you, including recordings of past presentations, this subject and many, many others. Um, and of course, while you're at the Master Gardens of Northern Virginia.org website, you can also look at the tried and true native plant fact sheets, which are astounding, wonderful resources. And of course, there's best practices listed there for various settings and best bets for plant selections. We have demo gardens, seven demo gardens throughout Arlington and Alexandria that are open to the public and information about them on the website. And we have 240 of the best master gardeners in the whole Commonwealth of Virginia. So thank you all for attending today and I'll take some questions. There was one about, could you talk about the relationship between cassava and elephant ear? Relationship? To my knowledge, you're not dating. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> they look very similar, don't they? But it's important to make sure that what you're choosing is edible and what is not. I'm not a grower of them. I have grown banana plants, though, that have a wonderful uh, <laughs> tropical look in the garden. Well, I think we'll wind it up because I uh, filled the time with these beautiful slides and so much information. We thank you very much. Well, thank you and Julie for helping out today and thank all of you for attending because I think this is to promote sustainability and food production and it's just such an important topic.